Salamat pagi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here today. I wish to thank Her Excellency, the Minister of Health, for officially opening the 11th Asia-Pacific Conference on Emergency Disaster Medicine, the APC-DEM Steering Committee for inviting me here to speak today, and of course, the Government of Indonesia for hosting this important event. Now, I have just been asked to slightly reduce my speaking time as we seem to be running a bit over schedule already. So with that in mind, I'll get right to it. As Dr. Tershino mentioned in his very kind introduction, my name is indeed Jacob Schaefer, and I am with the Prepare Pandemic Preparedness Project of International Medical Corps. I will be speaking on multi-sector pandemic preparedness, the whole of society approach. Now, before I begin, allow me two brief examples to set the stage for this concept of whole of society preparedness. My first example is of a lorry blockade of oil refineries in England in the year 2000. Now, of course, in England, lorries are large transport vehicles, specifically in this case, fuel tanker trucks. The protest was due to a, uh, or excuse me, the blockade was due to a protest in high fuel prices. And as a result, these tanker trucks were unable to deliver fuel to petrol stations. This resulted in 50% of petrol stations closing, and others were forced to ration due to a fuel shortage. 25, excuse me, 29% of private motorists were no longer able to drive then due to a lack of petrol, which strained public transportation networks as more people were utilizing public transportation services, and some routes were forced to close. In addition, there was a staff shortage at hospitals, amongst many other industries, because many workers were unable to show up for work. This resulted in a shutdown of non-emergency operations for several key hospitals and healthcare facilities. Also, there was a 300% rise in food prices, and in urban areas, store shelves began to run empty. ATM machines soon ran out of cash, and public fear and panic quickly set in. What is very striking about this example is that all of these impacts occurred within the first eight days of the fuel blockade. My second example is of the Spanish influenza 1918 pandemic. Now, all of us here are very familiar with the health sector and how it was completely overwhelmed with the sheer number of patients during the 1918 pandemic. But what is often not discussed is that 25% of public safety officers, firemen, policemen, security officers, did not show up for work because they were either dead themselves, dying, staying at home to take care of ill family members and friends, or were too fearful to go out in public for fear of contracting influenza. In addition, public transportation networks were closed in an attempt to halt the spread of the virus. Additionally, schools were closed, forcing working mothers, of course this is 1918, to stay at home and look after their children. Just a quick diagram of the estimated mortality rates, or excuse me, mortality figures for the 1918 pandemic. Specifically here in the ASEAN region, Indonesia had an estimated 1.5 million deaths. The Philippines saw 94,000 estimated deaths. What these two seemingly unrelated examples illustrate is the interconnectedness, this interwovenness of society, where the health sector is dependent upon the transportation sector, which is dependent upon the energy sector. And the food sector is dependent upon the banking and finance sector, which is dependent upon the security sector. Let me switch gears for a minute and briefly talk about the pandemic threat. Whenever we talk about the threat of a disaster, whether man-made or natural, we can gauge it with its relative likelihood of occurring versus its relative impact should it occur. Now, where some of these disasters fall on this map is open for discussion. But what I do want to point out is that pandemic influenza, although it is less likely to occur than, say, major industrial accidents or traffic accidents, its impact, should it occur, is massive. Specifically for the economic impact, and I should mention I'm borrowing this slide from Dr. Ingo Noy, the chief of party of the PREPARE project, this economic impact can be very severe. 
Some economists estimate that there is a reduction of perhaps 12.6% of world gross domestic product during a pandemic event. And as Dr. Malik Paris pointed out in his excellent presentation immediately before mine, is that at no time in human history are we closer to a pandemic event. New and re-emerging diseases are constantly occurring, such as this new SARS-like coronavirus, which has infected two people in Saudi Arabia, and we're all very much paying attention to right now. And when we talk about the impacts of a pandemic beyond the economic impacts, many people immediately associate with the health impacts. This includes, of course, the increased number of sick people, an increased number of dead people, and an increased demand for health services, which results in a strain on the health sector. When we talk about mitigating these health impacts of a pandemic, many people often discuss personal protective equipment and medical interventions like vaccines. The reason I hypothesize that these sorts of health interventions dominate the discussion and in turn policymakers and receive the funding, the money for pandemic preparedness is because they're very visual, very easy to connect the dots and understand. Things like temperature screeners at airports for passengers arriving into a country, it's a very visual thing. It reassures the public that something is being done. But what I want to focus on is the non-health impacts of a pandemic. These are things like high employee absenteeism, Perhaps up to 40% of employees in all sectors across society would not show up to their place of business during a pandemic, either because they're dead, they're ill, they're staying at home to take care of ill family members, or they're too fearful to venture out in public. There would also be disruptions in supply chains and a shift in demands of certain services. Another slide that I'm borrowing from Dr. Ingo Noy shows how there's a decrease and increase in supply and demand of specific essential services. There would be a decreased supply in, say, production, where production facilities, factories, production plants are closed because of a reduced number of workers. You would also have disruptions in transportation, international trade of commodities. There would be a decreased demand in retail trade, transportation, leisure travel, things like fine dining. But what is very important is that there would be an increased demand in certain services, things like water and sanitation. Telecommunications is very important, as more people would be using their telephones to, say, conduct business and meetings as they would not be wanting to meet people face to face. You'd have an increased number of people calling their family and friends regularly to check in on them, make sure that they're safe and they're healthy. You would also have an increase in ATM and online banking, which of course would additionally strain the telecommunications network, there would be an increase in health and life insurance claims, protection against insecurity, perhaps more a demand for more security workers at pharmacies and medical facilities. There would be an increased demand in power, and uh, power electricity and supply. And actually this is also very interesting because say at the uh, industrial areas of a city, you would have a decrease in the normal daily supply of electricity as production plants and manufacturing capabilities shut down, but there would be an increased supply at different hours of the day for residential areas because more people are staying at home. With these changes and shifts in supply and demand, coupled with very high employee absenteeism, can lead to a breakdown of essential services. Now, I've mentioned essential service a few times. What are the essential service sectors? Almost every human inhabited location on Earth is dependent upon certain critical necessary sectors for the normal healthy functioning of society. Different regions delineate these sectors in different ways. Specifically here in the Asia-Pacific region, ASEAN has identified eight essential service sectors. But no matter which way you slice them, every society is, of course, dependent on the health sector. And if I can get my laser pointer to work here, oh, there we go. Every society is, of course, dependent upon the health sector. But in addition, the water and sanitation sector, the food sector, the energy sector, telecommunications, transportation, finance, law and order, defense and military. And what we have seen that during a moderate to severe pandemic is that the health sector may quickly become overwhelmed. And even during a 
quote-unquote mild pandemic, i.e. SARS, there will be impacts on other essential service sectors beyond health. Therefore, it makes sense, and please pay attention here because this is one of the central theses of my presentation, that we not only prepare the health sector for a pandemic, which is usually the focus of these types of discussions, but that we also prepare the other eight essential service sectors, water, food, energy, telecommunications, transportation, finance, law and order. Furthermore, this multi-sectoral approach to pandemic preparedness must include all levels of society, civil, business, and government, from the national level all the way through down to the local community levels. Now, we've all seen this UN diagram here many times in many presentations in the past day and a half. So I will not belabor the point other than to say that to truly create this whole of society paradigm that seems to be all the rage in the disaster preparedness community, which parenthetically I very much agree with, then we must not only focus our efforts and discussion on the health sector, but all essential service sectors of society at all levels of society. It's interesting to note that when we prepare sectors in this way, this whole of society approach, when we prepare them for things like a shift in supply and demand of services and high absent employee absenteeism, it not only works for pandemic preparedness, but it can be utilized for other slow onset disasters, such as a lorry blockade of oil refineries. Now, as I mentioned, it seems to be the global consensus that this cutting edge sectoral approach to disaster preparedness is the best way to prepare societies for a pandemic. But what does this mean? How do you do this, practically speaking? I present to you the approach that the PREPARE project has undertaken as one example of sector preparedness. Oh, uh, by the way, I, I guess my presentation is smarter than I am. I should mention the Towards a Safer World initiative. TASW is a UN-backed global network of a diverse range of whole of society champions that are committed to maintaining the body of whole of society practice and communicating it widely in an effort to continue the mainstreaming of this paradigm um, and also to discuss lesson, lessons learned in an attempt to better understand how this whole of society approach can be adapted to greater disaster preparedness initiatives. Uh, this particular document was presented and deliberated at a conference in Rome in October of last year, and in the presence of many global practitioners, including some from the ASEAN region, including Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and I believe Myanmar. This document is a great resource, and I suggest checking it out if you're not familiar with it already. Okay, back to the PREPARE approach to sectoral pandemic preparedness. So the first step is to form a sectoral crisis management team for each essential service sector. Sectors are large beasts. Um, they're relatively undefined. They're comprised of a large number, uh, perhaps hundreds of service providers um, from public and private businesses, government line ministries, various associations and institutions and regulators. And although most sectors will have a national lead, such as a government line ministry, these ministries often lack the three critical components to effectively coordinate and lead any type of response across all service sectors, or excuse me, all service providers. Uh, these critical components that are needed are the mandate to reach across all service providers, the sufficient power and authority to do so, and the capacity to mount and coordinate such a large scale response. Therefore, it is necessary to establish a sectoral crisis management team of a sufficiently small number of key individuals from targeted service providers that can act as a sectoral authority to coordinate a pandemic response in accordance with the established sector pandemic preparedness and response plan. Which brings me to step two, developing a sector pandemic preparedness and response plan. So I'm going to call it PPRP for short. And what is it? It's a type of business continuity, or excuse me, it's a type of continuity of operations plan, which at its heart is similar to a business continuity plan that many of you may be familiar with. And similar to a business continuity plan, its central tenants will include things like risk analysis, identification of key functions and steps to protect those functions, 
and something similar to what would be an incident command structure. However, it's very important to point out that a sector is not a single autonomous entity, and therefore an SPPRP is different from a typical business continuity plan in a sector, or excuse me, it's different from a typical business continuity plan because a sector must coordinate across all companies to identify critical inter- and intra-sectoral dependencies. It must also enact a sector-wide monitoring mechanism, and an SPPRP must also clarify accountability. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip directly to an example of the framework that we're used to working with. And this example comes from the banking sector. Um, so as, and this is not exhaustive, of course. But the first step is to identify the essential services and functions of the sector. So for the banking sector, what does it do? Um, it provides cash in bank branches and ATMs. It provides payroll services for companies. Uh, banking sector provides insurance, provides bill pay services for customers. It provides loans and lines of credit. And it provides savings accounts and safety deposit, excuse me, safety deposit boxes. Now, I'm sure a bank does many more things, and if there's any bankers in the audience, I hope they don't hunt me down after my presentation. The second step is then to identify potential impacts of a pandemic or that a pandemic would have on those essential services that the sector is providing. So I'm just going to use the example of providing cash in bank branches and ATMs. So what would happen during a pandemic to that service? Well, perhaps you would have more people needing cash because people are maybe stockpiling food, they're buying medicines. Um, there's many reasons that people would need cash during a pandemic. And so as a result, you may not have enough staff to stock ATMs because your staff may be ill, um, high employee absenteeism. As a result of that, you would have more people coming to the bank to get cash because the ATMs may run out of cash, resulting in long queues at the bank. In addition, you may be short-staffed of tellers, again, due to the employee absenteeism. You could have a possible run on the banks then due to public fear, which would, of course, raise security issues. It's also important to identify service providers and key actors. So what are the service providers and key actors that allow the banking sector to provide cash in bank branches and ATMs? Um, well, that may be staff that stock the ATM bank tellers to dole out cash at the bank, and local bank branches. And of course, it's also important to identify other priority dependencies and other sectors for that service. So there's other sectors that the bank is reliant upon to provide cash. One may be the security guards that stock the ATM or guard money transport. These are usually third-party contractors. Another sector is a telecommunications sector for ATM account withdrawal, because without telecommunications, internet, and telephone lines, ATMs would not function, online banking would not function. Of course, the banking sector is dependent upon the energy sector for ATM and bank operation, and the health sector as well for the protection of bank tellers. And it also, it's very important then for the government, for the banking sector to define what measures it could enact or provide to support the government's response to the pandemic. So some examples may be to ensure that payroll services for essential companies are protected. You know, the energy sector is very important, as we have established. Maybe for the national energy company, the banking sector could guarantee that workers will be paid. Uh, banks could also suspend loan and credit payments in order to reduce public fear. <laughs> I think we'd all love that. And it could maybe provide low-interest loans for hospitals or other institutions to purchase large amounts of personal protective equipment. Then one must identify specific measures and actions that the sector could take in order to assure the continuity of operations of that service. So what could the banking sector do to protect the provision of cash in bank branches and ATMs? Perhaps it could be a memorandum of understanding with security companies and or the military or police to make sure that there's sufficient staff to guard the stocking of ATMs. It could be an MOU with the telecommunications sector to make sure that banks are prioritized for service provision. Perhaps the banking sector could extend bank, bank branch hours in order to allow greater access to cash. And of course, very importantly, cross-training and reallocation of non-essential staff to more essential functions. So perhaps the loan officer wouldn't be so necessary during a pandemic, and that loan officer could move to the front of the bank and function as a teller to dispense cash. 
Also, very importantly, is sector identification control measures in the workplace. So what could the banking sector do to protect its staff and its customers? Uh, these could be things like plastic sheets between the tellers and the public to reduce the transmission of microbial agents. It could be an increased disinfection of touch points in the bank. So perhaps you would instruct the janitors or cleaning crew to perhaps vacuum less often, but in turn increase the amount of times they disinfect touch points, common touch points. It could be stockpiling of prophylaxis prior to the pandemic, things like Tamiflu. They could reroute pedestrian traffic and traffic flow in banks and ATMs to make sure that the public and workers aren't meeting face to face. And of course, having arrangements for home-based work for non-essential staff. Thirdly then, step three, would be to integrate the sectoral pandemic preparedness and response plan across all levels of society. So each individual sector pandemic preparedness and response plan would include tenants of the public sector, private sector, and of course civil society, vulnerable groups, et cetera. And each of these eight plans then would have critical interlinkages between the other sectors. So for example, the banking plan would have critical linkages to telecommunications and energy and so on. And all of these individual sector pandemic preparedness and response plans then should be linked in some way to either a pre-established or a newly developed national multi-sector coordination plan. And this national multi-sector coordination plan, in order to achieve the whole of society preparedness all the way down from the top of the government levels through to the local community levels, should be linked to or include provincial municipal coordination plans and finally, district municipal coordination plans. So let me give you an example just real quickly or two examples of the practical experience that the PREPARE project has in doing, using this methodology to prepare sectors for a pandemic. Uh, I of course would be remiss if I didn't mention that the PREPARE project is a USAID or United States Agency for International Development funded initiative which is implemented by the International Medical Corps. Uh, we work in four countries in Africa, two countries in Asia, Indonesia and the Philippines, as well as some regional engagements including with the East African community and with ASEAN initiatives. Um, I'll give you an example then because of course we're in Asia of the Prepare Indonesia project and then real quickly the Prepare Philippines project. So here in Indonesia, the Prepare project is led by the Coordinating Ministry for People's Welfare with guidance from what we call the Project Oversight Group. The Project Oversight Group is an amalgamation of different agencies including BMPB, which is the local National Disaster Management Authority, International Medical Corps, Komonas, which is a zoonosis commission, the Ministry of Health, UN OCHA, UN Indonesia, and WHO. Uh, this is actually a, 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 we are a strength, excuse me, it's a strength and a, a highlight of the local Indonesia Prepare project because you have a combination of a diverse range of agencies with different mandates coming together to work in a coordinated way to achieve whole society pandemic preparedness. Then we have small groups of sectoral representatives to actually draft these sector pandemic preparedness and response plans um, through a series of workshops and learning events. Um, I, I should mention that the three sectors of focus in Indonesia are the energy sector, the telecommunications sector, and the transportation sector. And the reason, of course, that we have a small group of representatives drafting these plans is because it's not efficient or useful to have hundreds of people, hundreds of service providers gathered around one table in order to draft a single plan. It just doesn't work. So what we've done is we've selected a group of key sector representatives from key institutions in order to come up with the first initial drafts of the sector pandemic preparedness and response plan. And then they dis disseminate this draft plan through the leadership of the line ministries to a greater number of stakeholders and, and sector institutions. These stakeholders then provide feedback and input to the plan, which is then gathered and incorporated back into the sector pandemic preparedness and response plan. This way it has the feedback of a large diverse number of sector stakeholders. This plan then will be uh, validated for gaps and I'd, excuse me, this plan will be validated and gaps identified in a tabletop exercise come this November. Um, I don't think I have time to go into all the strengths and weaknesses um, that we've learned or lessons learned from Prepare Indonesia. Um, other than to say that this process demands strong political support of course, political support is crucial to providing a platform for the engagement of all stakeholders. 
Support for multi-sector preparedness needs to be mandated at the highest levels of government. And while this concept of multi-sector preparedness is generally well accepted in Indonesia, defining clear roles and responsibilities among collaborating government organizations remains a challenge. For effective preparedness and coordination, a single lead focal agency really needs to command, coordinate, and communicate across all sectors. And in reality, few government agencies have the political mandate and capacity to achieve this, specifically in developing nations. In the Philippines, and I, excuse me, I'm going to jump ahead here for a minute, but in the Philippines, the preparedness planning process is being led by the National Disaster Management Organization. And NDMOs are relatively new and robust organizations that are very uniquely positioned to integrate with a diverse range of stakeholders across society. By effectively removing this pandemic preparedness from the pigeonhole of public health and squarely placing it under the auspice of an NDMO, it has enabled multi-sectoral ministerial coordination and importantly, the ability to produce formal legislation and legal degrees decrees that remedy institutional preparedness fatigue and mandate whole of society preparedness. I guess what I'm trying to say, and I apologize if I'm lost in a flurry of words here, is that without pandemic preparedness being led through a national government agency that has the capacity and the authority to reach across all sectors, the planning process may stagnate and the outcome will only be, I guess, partial society preparedness. This is why here in Indonesia, we're very fortunate that this project is being led by the Coordinating Ministry of People's Welfare, or Menko Kesra for those of you that speak Bahasa Indonesia. So finally, let me just real quickly mention the Prepare Philippines. Um, as I mentioned, it's led by the NDMO, which is called the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. And in the Philippines, we form technical working groups for each sector. Um, and we're focused in all eight essential service sectors in the Philippines. And these technical working groups drafted uh, the first drafts of the sectoral pandemic preparedness response plans during a series of workshops, sector meetings, and other learning events. These technical working groups were chaired by their respective line ministries. But it's very important to point out that it also included excellent participation from both the public sector and a very engaged private sector. Uh, I think one of the reasons that the private sector was so engaged in this planning process is because very rarely do they have the opportunity to participate in a sort of a policy making decisions at the national level. And so by participating in this process and having their views heard, they were able to really protect their interests as well. The private sector actually called this a breakthrough, which is very encouraging for the PREPARE project. Additionally, we piloted the whole of society community preparedness within the city of Santa Rosa. Um, we were trying to investigate um, how well this sort of paradigm of multi-sector approach could be applied within a local community and also explore the, inter the interlinkages between national sectoral planning and local community sectoral planning. And finally, the the plans, the sectoral preparedness and response plans, we validated the plans and identified the gaps during a large tabletop exercise just two weeks ago. In a nutshell, the outcome was that the Philippines has a pandemic preparedness and response plan for the health sector. But the government of the Philippines acknowledged that there is not, I repeat, not a national multi-sectoral pandemic preparedness and response coordination plan. The NDRMC um, announced that they would immediately begin developing this sort of national plan and that the individual SPPRPs would be linked and play a major role in this plan. This is just a photo of Undersecretary Benito Ramos announcing to the media that the NDRMC would undertake this planning process. And finally, for more information on the methodology or outcomes, I encourage you to visit the International Medical Corps website to uh, read some information about this exercise. So that concludes my presentation. Um, let me just finish real quickly with these take home messages. Uh, one, in order to effectively prepare for a pandemic, we must prepare all essential sectors of a society, not just the health sector. Two, this multi-sectoral approach needs to encompass not only the national government, but it must also include public and private businesses, 
and the civil society from the very top down all the way through to the local community levels. It's only in this way that we can achieve true whole of society multi-sector pandemic preparedness. Three, preparing for a pandemic in this way is not only useful for disease, but it can be easily operationalized to mitigate the impacts of other slow onset disasters, such as flooding, volcanic eruptions, civil unrest, zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Practically speaking, number four, in order to prepare a sector, one must develop a sector crisis management team and also sectoral pandemic preparedness and response plans. And finally, number five, each sector preparedness response plan must be linked to a pre-existing or a newly established national multi-sector coordination plan. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to any questions or comments during what I hope is a very lively uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much.